Hello, everybody. We are waiting a few minutes uh, to give everybody a chance to join the call. Hope you hear me fine. Yes. Yeah. I see people are joining. Yeah, but let's uh, slowly start then. Uh, welcome everybody to our webinar today. I'm Gerlin, I'm gonna be your host. I'm gonna lead this discussion uh, between those guys you see here. And we're gonna talk about the uh, subscription e-bikes and scooters. So that's, uh, I wouldn't even call it a trend anymore because it's been around for a while, but only recent years uh, subscription fleets have really started to grow. And uh, we've invited uh, the CEOs of three subscription fleets to share their insights into how to efficiently operate uh, this business model. So let's have a quick round of introduction. We have here Driss Ibn Mansour, I hope I pronounced it correctly, from Motta, uh, French uh, e-bike service. Um, so hey Driss. Hi, hi, Kelly. Nice, nice to see you. Yeah, uh, we have here Christian Marosta from Aika e-scooter subscription service. So um, uh, soon to become an e-scooter e e subscription service. <laughs> yeah, hello, everybody. More about that later. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we actually have a third uh, subscription fleet uh, representative here, but he will join a few minutes late. So he will jump in the conversation uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but we also have here Sven Lersche, who is uh, my colleague from Komodil, who will share his uh, insights and knowledge about how connectivity enables uh, businesses like subscription fleets. So, yeah, um, without further ado, let's uh, let's start. And uh, I would just like to say a few organizational uh, bits that we are going to aim to finish the talk in around 40 minutes. And we're going to answer your questions. Uh, Meanwhile, and uh, at the end also, if you want, you can leave them in the QA box down below. <clears throat> it should be available for everybody. And uh, we're gonna answer all the questions you might have. So uh, to start the discussion, so um, I found some data that says that, uh, that the subscription fleets are set to grow 30% for the next, 30% each year for the next 10 years. So, um, but uh, as I mentioned, the uh, subscription is nothing new. It's been around since 2014 when Swapfeeds, one of the first subscription services launched their bike uh, service. Uh, what's your take on why now is the right time for subscription fleets? Uh, who wants to take this? Driss is being clever and letting me to start, although when you looked at his LinkedIn profile, he should have much better answers. Uh, but I think it's not uh, you know, just connected with the mobility side, it's actually connected with the larger kind of uh, buy now, pay later movement uh, that has also started from, the, from uh, electronics, but even more further down, you know, the subscription as such. I think it started from mobile phone companies around 15 years ago when previously you paid for every minute and then you had a monthly subscription for your mobile phone. And then these uh, software companies picked it up and it became a thing in you know, software as a service and then it moved to Netflix and then it became more used, uh, kind of a used or understood concept by then consumers. Uh, so. Uh, and you know, then this kind of subscription as a model has has moved from mobile phone plans to everything else. And I think Apple did a very strong push a few years back with you know having this their own uh, subscription for the phones. So the business model has really proven itself and has shown in other industries that people love to use it. It's very carefree and etc. And I think it's just logical that is now kind of ending up in the vehicle segment as well. And and I think the thirty percent growth also just comes from the fact that there's so much growth in e-bikes in, in urban transportation. And, and I think Tris can really kind of comment on how things are picking up in Paris. I think it's quite crazy how much money is poured into infrastructure there. Yeah, just maybe to complete uh, what, what Christian was saying, I, I totally agree there's like kind of a structural change around 
people want to access usage more than they want to access ownership. You will always be a, there. There will always be a market for retail. There will there will always be people who want to own and buy the the e-bike. But what we're saying, at least with our uh, fleet of users and our our, our members, uh, that it has it's a market that is more and more driven by service more than product. So people want to buy a service, they want to buy an experience uh, more than they want to buy and own the product. So the service part and the servicing part of, of, of the business is essential. Uh, and uh, and uh, more and more people are entering this market uh, because as Christian said, the market is going really fast. Uh, Paris is a good example. Paris is investing massively in infrastructure. So you have more and more people who are totally new uh, to commuting when an e-bike within the city. And because they're new, uh, there's a lot of barriers to entry. The first one being the price. Obviously, as you know, an, an e-bike costs uh, somewhere around 2,500 euros, uh, up to 3,000 euros if you go for like a higher end products. And they're also afraid of like the potential maintenance that comes with it, the theft and everything. Uh, so, so the subscription is the perfect way to address all of those problems and to really enter the market from an angle of service, an angle of uh, providing a, a totally peace of mind uh, service and not uh, not having to own the, the assets. So I think if you look at the market, subscription is kind of a logical uh, uh, evolution uh, and, and it's a perfect way to uh, to bridge the gap between shared mobility and, um, and uh, traditional uh, retail. And maybe yeah. one thing one thing I wanted to add, which is a peace of mind, I think there's still a lot of people for whom whether it's a scooter, whether it's a bike, and if it has a battery, they still feel a little bit of afraid of the technology. They don't know how to exactly handle it. Maybe it will break and et cetera. And the uh, subscription really takes that you know, off as well, because you know that if something is wrong, it will be replaced and it actually, you don't have to own it and et cetera. So it, it also kind of takes off this, uh, I would say, risk or being afraid of new technology. So what I'm hearing is that the time is right because the two kind of things are merging the huge micro mobility movement and the overall sentiment that that you don't have to own things and you can just subscribe to them. Um, yeah, but in, in the micro micro mobility sector, we're also seeing that companies that so far have been selling e bikes and scooters, they're doing this uh, subscription business uh, uh, now kind of on the side. Uh, as extra revenue stream. So we are seeing uh, brands like Cake and uh, Rad Power uh, also uh, renting their bikes out for long term, while uh, Moto, for example, is uh, solely focusing on subscription fleets. Uh, so what's your take on that? Is this uh, something that's normal in this business, like a hybrid that you can do subscription, but also sell your vehicles or, or yeah, what's your thoughts on this? I can start with this one because we've uh, when we started Moto, we we um, we really thought about like should we uh, both sell the vehicle and offer a subscription on the side and kind of combine both models. Uh, what we realized is that it's extremely hard to combine both models. First of all, because the hardware uh, when you when you design your vehicle, the vehicle you design for sale is very different from the vehicle you design for subscription. Uh, so it's very hard to kind of have the same vehicle for both resell or like uh, sell and, uh, and, uh, and, and subscription. Uh, when you design a vehicle for subscription, you design for uh, durability, you design for uh, operability and you always have repairs in mind. Uh, so when we started working on Moto, uh, we immediately uh, decided that we would just go for subscription and the vehicles that we will design will be designed obviously to attract the user, to be as attractive as possible, but also to be uh, as repairable as possible because that's essential and it, that's an essential part of our, of our business and of our unit economics. Uh, the second thing is um, when, you, when you start a subscription uh, business, uh, you really need to have your operations in order and you really need to be really good at repairing and, and servicing bikes basically. So when you look at brands uh, like the ones you mentioned or the ones like that are uh, pretty uh, pretty famous like Cowboy and Van Move, they've started from the product point of view uh, and they're trying to evolve towards a service uh, or improving their service and it always has been a struggle for them. Uh, so if you talk to a user or like a, an owner of a, of a Van Moof or a Cobay, they love the product, but very often they will tell you I'm struggling to get servicing for the bike. Um, so we took it in the other direction. Uh, we decided to start with servicing and make sure that we have the best service possible and make sure that people are 
satisfy their own service and build on this and improve our hardware as, as, we, as we go. Uh, so for us, it was first uh, kind of um, getting the service right and the, the whole repair operations right and keep improving and iterating on the, on the hardware. One thing I wanted to add is that I think there's something in between as well. You have, you know, sales, and then you have the subscription where you really pay a monthly fee. It's uh, it's flexible. People come to you. They give you the vehicle. They maintain it. But in between, you have this classical buy now, pay later model. And I think many companies actually call that the subscription uh, as well. Uh, so sometimes it gets confusing. And also, I think in the electronics world, it's usually actually the model where you just have monthly payments. And then every two years, you get a new device. Uh, um, you know, there's a scooter company called Augment, for example, uh, they only do two year period. So it's it's not really your classical subscription. It's more a way of doing uh, long term payments. So I think that classical companies will more look into deleting the barrier of entry. So trying to give you better payment terms so that people would buy more. But exactly as uh, Driss said, they're not going to be service companies. So they're looking ways to make you make this decision faster, but actually it's really not the subscription product in, in, in that sense, in my mind. So uh, yeah, that there's a difference, but one thing I wanted to say is that if there's some companies who do both, then they haven't yet gotten really good at subscription because uh, if you look at the phone companies, then I think there's, I don't know if there's possible to buy a phone plan without the monthly subscription. I think they're now all on monthly subscription. Nobody charges you per minute anymore. So if that goes the same way in vehicles, you were gonna end up with just subscription vehicles. You know, we'll see. Um, but uh, if we talked about uh, the 30% yearly growth of subscription service, then who, who, who will need to give away their market to, uh, is it the sharing fleets? Is it those uh, privately sold vehicles or or who who uh, kind of loses thanks to the fact that the subscriptions are um, growing so fast? Hopefully, cars. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know, you know, Dries, you can comment, but I think in Paris it's for sure cars and public public or you know old ways of moving. So um, I I genuinely believe that subscription is an extremely good offering for people to to do their first decision to kind of convert to this type of vehicle. Because as has as Dries said, it's a 2,500 euro decision. Doesn't matter how much money you have, you're still not gonna make it uh, uh, easily. You're still gonna think about it. Uh, but subscription just gives you this feeling of, oh, I'm gonna just try it for a few months and see how it goes. So I think most of these people probably are people who don't own a bike today. Yeah, uh, let's yeah. hope so. <laughs> I can I can share a few uh, insights, uh, a few data about what we're seeing at Moto. Uh, on average, people use about three times a day. Uh, so that's kind of the, the the stats we're seeing. And most, I would say, like a hundred, maybe ninety five percent of our users are using the bike plus another uh, transportation mode. Meaning that you cannot see like the mobility market as a unilateral, like a unique transportation mode. There's always like uh, a multimodal ap approach. So I think that if you if you look from the perspective of like who's winning the market, I think that everyone is winning with this growth because um, when you when you uh, for instance when you start with sharing shared bikes and you use e-bikes on a daily basis, uh, at some point you make the calculation and you realize that you're spending hundreds of euros per month because every ride is like five euros and if you use it two three times a day you end up pay, paying hundreds of euros per per month. So you start thinking about like what should I do? Should I go and buy my own or should I? Should I keep this flexibility and peace of mind and go through our subscription? Uh, so shared mobility is actually a great entry for us. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people stop using the shared vehicles at all. They just like complement it with uh, our service, for instance. So we really see that as a complementary service. I think retail will always be there. I think retail will always grow. Well, most people will still want to own things or a big share of people will, will want to own things. But just like Christian said, uh, maybe you subscribe to a bike for like, 12 months, 18 months, and after 18 months, you start making calculation, well, after maybe 24 months, I can own my own e-bike, so uh, so I'd rather buy my own. So it's, it's different phases, 
I think it's different needs and for every need there's like an offer. Um, but that, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think they're actually like complementary. And, and I think we should not really just think about, you know, monthly fee and vehicle. Uh, what you brought out is really the service. I mean, if you have your own vehicle and something happens with it, or, or especially if it's a bike, bikes need a service at least once a year, or sometimes maybe even twice a year, you will always have this pain of taking it somewhere and then somebody maintaining it and you being without it for, I don't know, a week or two or etc. So I think if you're, you know, a lazy human being, then yes, you might do this calculation that you just said, but you might still end up with using a subscription vehicle because it's just the service is so much better and, and you know, feel so much more comfortable. So 100% I agree that the service part is, is extremely important in this offering. Uh, but if you're already talking about service part, uh, then Chris, uh, you have been in operations for a few years already. Um, but Christian, you're only setting up your uh, operations. So I would like to now talk about like, what do you see are the, the biggest challenges in setting up uh, your uh, subscription fleet operations to truly like offer this service that people are paying monthly for? So what's the, what's the biggest kind of uh, blockers to get over when you're uh, uh, setting up and scaling your uh, fleet? Uh, maybe I, may, I can start with a few uh, uh, feedback from our experience. I think when you, when you uh, subscribe to a vehicle, it's your own personal vehicle and you're paying on a monthly basis. So your expectations on the level of servicing is very high. Um, if, you, if you're using a shared vehicle and the vehicle doesn't work, there's no battery or uh, the vehicle is broken, you simply switch to the next vehicle. Uh, so the experience is not great, but it's acceptable because you have other options uh, around you. When it's your own subscribed bike, uh, if your bike doesn't work, uh, that's extremely frustrating as an experience. Like you wake up in the morning, you want to go to work, you have a meeting and you try your bike, it doesn't work. Uh, and you know that you're paying for this on a monthly basis, that's very frustrating. Uh, so number one, uh, I think that customer service and customer support needs to be really reactive and efficient, and we need to be really good at tr troubleshooting. Um, so we do a lot of work at Moto on remote di diagnostic, for instance, like through, uh, through IoT, basically. So making sure that we're able to at least give answers to our users and at least identify the problem and potentially troubleshoot the problem remotely. And if we can, give another option to our user. So that's number one. Uh, number two is uh, if there's a, a damage that we cannot, a bit that we need to repair, uh, our operation networks need to be pretty efficient. So it needs to be pretty seamless for the user because they're paying, they're paying for the seamlessness. Uh, so you need to really make it easy for them uh, to, to, uh, to um, repair the bike. So you either offer uh, pick up solutions or you have like a, a repair shop network a repair shop partner that is close to the to the user who can offer servicing and you need to make sure that you can repair as fast as possible as good as possible uh, so for instance our promise as a service is that we rep repair your bike within 48 hours and if we're not able to repair it we give you a replacement bike the reason uh, for this is that you basically it's your main way of transportation so you have really low tolerance uh, or you really don't want to be without a bike for so long that that we need to make sure that we um, that we're able to uh, uh, to service as fast as possible. And to be honest, every every uh, every month uh, we lose a few uh, users who've had a bad experience with us. So, for instance, uh, we were like a bit too slow to repair the bike, or we were not able to travel through the bike. And because uh, this experience can be extremely frustrating people churn and and, uh, and churn to other uh, solutions. So you, that's why you need to be really good and nail this, this servicing and this kind of user experience uh, to make sure that you can retain your users on the long term and then you can really differentiate, differentiate your, yourself from like, any other solutions. What we are, you know, we build scooters, uh, uh, electric scooters called the Aika T and we haven't launched a subscription yet, uh, so I don't know if I should be in the panel, but uh, but I was invited. Uh, and, and But it's very different, I just want to say, with scooters, we're going to launch on 18th of May, so it's in seven days. But what is very different with scooters is that you can do a very wide geography because the scooter is easy to ship. So uh, if uh, if bike companies always have to be local in the city where they operate, then, then how we are going to, to do it and we're going to see how well it works. But we know it works for this company called Augment, it works for the company Unagi in US, is that you ship the product to the user, the user uses the product. If he has an issue 
and you can uh, you know remote diagnose or in in contact with the user understand what kind of uh, need, uh, help they need and if you can't do it uh, remotely then you just ship him a new scooter he gets the new scooter puts the old one in the box and the old one goes back so uh, this is how we're gonna set it up in a, in a kind of a parcel setup uh, that's going to be very different than it is with bikes um, and again I mean for us uh, from the point of view of people don't want to wait uh, it's extremely important that the parcel arrives to you also at least in you know 48 hours or so so there's a lot of fine tuning in logistics to to achieve that but as far as we've talked with and, and understood how it works with uh, you know now your augment it doesn't seem to be a blocker it, it it seems to it seems to be working of course the good thing with scooters is that they also have significantly less moving parts than bikes so bikes uh, do require also more maintenance. But uh, talking about maintenance, Tris, can you share what's like how often do your users uh, request maintenance for their bikes, and like what are the main main issues that they that appear? Yes. Um, so so the the repair element is is directly uh, related to your hardware. So like the choice of the components, the choice of like the um, you know the the type of brakes you're using, the choice of like the types of battery you're using is is essential. So you need to make sure that you go for very strong components with really good like uh, quality levels. Uh, otherwise, the business doesn't work. Uh, so what we're seeing with our first versions, we have two versions of of the bike. We have a, a version right now. Uh, in circulation in, in Paris, uh, that's our V1 uh, of, of, of Moto, and we have a second version coming into market uh, in, in, in the next few days. Uh, so with our first version of the bike in circulation, what we're seeing is that every month we do some kind of operation on 20% of the fleet. Mm -hmm. So every month we touch 20% uh, of our fleet for any kind of repairs. Um, the most repairs we see are related to the brakes, uh, so the first the first version of the bike has mechanical brakes. Uh, so when you have mechan mechanical brakes, you go for more repairs. You need to adjust the brakes. You need to like recalibrate the brakes. Sometimes you need to change them. So that like implies a lot of repairs. Uh, the way to correct this is to is to switch to hydraulic brakes, which is the case for our second version of the bike. So we will see like significant a lower amount of repairs on on, on the brakes. Um, the other main kind of issues we have are related to. Uh, electrical problem. Uh, so basically you have a problem with your controller, with your engine um, that you need to troubleshoot and, and, and work on. Uh, that's still a limited the marginal uh, number of, of problems, but when it occurs, when it happens, uh, well, you need to uh, retrieve the bike and, and do like a uh, thorough uh, analysis and investigation on, on the controller on the engine. But the I think one of the super interesting thing about about the, uh, about the subscription model, uh, and because I come from the sharing world, I used to work for shared shared operators. Uh, the, the the frequency of of repairs is of damage is much much lower. I think it's I would say three to four times lower than for like a usual uh, shared mobility operator, simply because the people really have the feeling of owning the vehicle, of owning the bike, uh, and that makes a huge difference. Um, so yeah, I, I would say 20% of the fleet, we are confident that we can lower that to 10%. So every month we repair 10% of our fleet uh, and that we're able to do all the repairs within 48 hours. So 10%, that would be a bike comes in for service once per year, roughly, right? Yes, exactly. But one thing I wanted to ask from you is that um, uh, two people like flag their interest for, for a maintenance or help. Uh, let's say if the brakes are just squeaking or or do they really flag it like when the brakes don't work anymore? Because, you know, if you look at these large cities or, I don't know, Holland or, or, or you know, Amsterdam or, or Copenhagen, then usually people ride their bikes as long as the chain breaks and then they just can't get forward anymore. So I think with personal vehicles, they just take it to like extreme and then even they really can't use it, then only then they will go to the service. But in, in your case, as you don't kind of have to pay extra to people who kind of do it much earlier or they're too lazy and they still wait until it can't be used. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Actually, the less people come and see us, the happier we are, right? Because if they come and, and get a repair that costs us money, because obviously we don't charge for repair, it's included in the sub subscription price. Um, so what we're seeing, it's interesting, is that you have an, 
on uh, on average people come 20% of the time like 20% of the fleet comes back for repair but then you have like high end and lows so you'd have people people who come every month no matter what they come every month to check their brakes they come every month to make sure that the the battery is still in good shape they come every month because they have a question so that people cost you a lot of money right uh, this is the way it is you also like uh, you've also like um, uh, build this this product for them and then you have people who just you never see from the moment they take the bike to the moment they return in 12 months, 15 months, 16 months later, you've never seen them. Uh, so they've basically almost cost you nothing. Uh, and then it's all about the average. You don't have a business if you have every single user who comes back to you every single month, there's no way you can be profitable, right? It's not just a, that, that doesn't work out. The numbers don't work out. Where you're counting on people who are going to come to you very regularly being compensated by the people who are never going to show up. Mm -hmm. They're never going to come in to, to. So there's like both, uh, both, uh, both, um, both kind of both options. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, there are more people who never come than are people who come regularly. Uh, and the other thing is that the better the, the hardware, the less people will come to you and, and uh, the better the choice of the components, the better the choice of like the battery and all, and, and all those things, the less people will come to you. So, so all in all, uh, the longer the vehicle lasts, the more money it makes you, basically. But um, Sven, uh, <laughs> I would like to give some word to you also. So uh, Co-Module works with several subscription fleets. So uh, we provide connectivity for them. And you are quite familiar with uh, how, how to raise this uh, total cost of ownership. For Maybe you can just share some insights on that. How, how does technology help to do that yeah thank you very much Galen first of all um I I'm going to be a bit more technical than and because of that I, I didn't want to crash the nice discussion from before uh, but just total cost of ownership is a very central question that we see at our customers so uh, and as just discussed uh it's it's all about cost and how to make them or how to make these bikes as cost uh, cost efficient over lifetime as possible and we see some, um, yeah, some major cost blocks. First one, and I think the biggest one might be the uh, everything regarded with theft. So if the bike is is stolen and away, it's a cost. But uh, everything regards to theft recovery is something that also costs money. But it can be more efficient the better you can, for example, remotely check the location of the bikes. So this is one point that that we also at Comodio try to address and uh, help our customers with but apart from that uh, one big thing um, that uh, yeah, allows especially the service costs that you uh, also mentioned Chris is uh, the, the ability of making over the air updates so imagine you have your your, your e-bike with the drivetrain x and the drivetrain needs an update so one option would be to call every customer or to text every customer please come into the workshop and I do the update for you um, or the much better option would be remotely press a button and all bikes are being flashed automatically and uh, basically no cost occur. And this is also what we addressed very much during the last years and have integrations with different drivetrains. So this yeah, is one big thing that we see. And uh, parallel to this also new features. So once you get a new or you want to implement a new feature on your bike, you, make, you want to make some changes. For example, uh, lower, lowering the maximum speed. Maybe a bad example, but uh, you, you might willing to do it. Um, uh, then you could also do this remotely without uh, getting people into the workshop. So yeah, I think there are many points that can be optimized and um, yeah, we try to, to assist in the best way. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, theft recovery. And if I put myself in the shoes of uh, like a user for subscription fleets, I think uh, this theft thing is like the biggest selling argument for me that I don't need to worry about it uh, in case anything happens. So Christian and Tris, like, what's like, how do you how do you sell this uh, theft insurance thing on top of your uh, service? Is it included or like, do you see this as a major uh, kind of uh, reassurance to go for this kind of service that? Uh, Whatever happens, I don't have to deal with it. So yeah. Uh, yeah. For us, it's uh, we're still setting it up, uh, but we are gonna have two different uh, types of subscription. One is kind of annual. The other one is flexible. 
uh, and we are including uh, theft insurance. We just still haven't figured out what will be the uh, what's the what's what's it called in English when you have to pay amount yourself as well when it's stolen. Uh, yeah, like your own kind of. Yeah, there's a word for it. But anyway, <laughs> deductible, I think it's called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, we haven't decided exactly where's the deductible. But the interesting part is that you know if you go as a as a as a single user um, and you own your own bike and you go to get an insurance, then you will get an offering of let's say you know 100 units of, or 100 euros. But as we go there, we will insure you know thousands or hundreds of bicycles, and there's no customer acquisition cost for the for the insurer, which is their biggest cost. So we get the price three, four times lower than what you would get as a, as a personal use. So picking it in, whether you you have it inside the regular subscription or whether you have an additional fee for that, uh, it's going to be much better value for money than it will be for for the for the single users. So yeah, it's a question mark whether you want to earn on that or whether you just want to give it in a very good pricing for the user. Uh, but this is a, a cool place where you can earn much more. And there's one more thing why it's even more cheaper to you is because for a personal vehicle, the insurer has to pay the full amount of the bicycle basically back to the user, you know, including dealer margins, including uh, VATs. But in our case, they just have to cover the cost of the hardware, you know, of the scooter. And this is significantly lower than it would be if you would buy it through a dealership, including all the taxes and et cetera. So the insurance cost is significantly lower and it really makes sense to kind of include it into the offering. Um, but yeah, we haven't seen how many of them are stolen. So uh, interesting to, uh, to hear from Driss, what's the reality? And will, yeah. the insurance, will the insurance company still work with you after three months <laughs> if they see the theft numbers? So, yeah, that, that's a very good point, Christian. Actually, it's a very challenging part in Paris. There's a massive theft race in Paris. I think it's probably one of the worst cities in Europe. Uh, I, I was, the, when I was working at a, at a scooter company, we had like rankings of like the cities every uh, every week with the, the highest theft rates and Paris was always top three. So it's definitely like, like an issue here. Um, so you have, I guess, two ways to deal with this. Uh, number one is to be uh, preventive, to make sure that you have like an insurance in, uh, in place. Uh, so we have, we are insured. All of our bikes are insured. Uh, we still own we own the bikes. Uh, Moto owns the bikes, so we are insuring the bikes for ourselves. Uh, the bikes are insured against theft and uh, and damages. Uh, so we pay a monthly fee uh, to an insurer. Uh, Christian, you're right. We are like our our fee is much more competitive than if you had to do it yourself uh, because we have volumes and also because we sell. At least we, we promote the fact that all our bikes have IoT, so they're connected. We can track them, so that we assure the, the insurance. And, uh, and we also sell the fact that we're really good at retrieving our bikes. Uh, so basically we have uh, we have theft occurring almost every week uh, or sometimes almost every day. Uh, but the way to deal with this is that we're tracking our bikes. So we're able to be quite reactive when a, when, a, when a theft occurs. And then we're able to either go with the police and retrieve the, the bike or work with a, a security team uh, that we used to work with uh, in my previous job. And we go and retrieve the bike two times out of three. Uh, so we have become quite quite uh, efficient and, at, at retrieving bikes, and um, and what? Uh, what did you say? How much? What was the retrieval ratio? Two out of three. Two out because, of three. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's keepers. very good. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, and and uh, and the other way is to make sure that you're educate your users on the fact that they need to attach the bike. Uh, that's pretty obvious, uh, and that they they. Um, if there is a theft and we're not able to recover the bike, there is a waiver fee of 200 euros, and then kind of like puts also responsibility with the user to make sure that like they, you know, they secure the bike whenever they they park it. But one question I have is that uh, as you use IoT, um, are you able to make the after sale value of the bike basically zero because of the IoT in the sense that you can kind of turn it off from the IoT, yeah. and nobody can really turn it on and use it anymore? So the way we've designed our bikes is that we can re retrofit the bike without IoT. So you remove the IoT and then you can just put the switch button. Uh, so if you decide to resell the bike without the IoT, you can just replace it by like an on-off button on, on the on the bike. That's pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. So that's not good. 
So that's not good for commission. <laughs> that I, I could jump in. <laughs> yeah. Yes, go, go ahead. No, 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 sorry. I, I just said I could yeah. jump in and yeah. give you a technical solution on hand for disabling the bike once it is stolen. But let's talk about this later. <laughs> but uh, Sven, you uh, also working with uh, some subscription fleets that are uh, common use customers. How do you see the, the theft rate uh, and recovery uh, is uh, how big of a problem it is and how is it being sold? I, I have heard of, of similar numbers. So um, so I'm also not into very much detail together with these customers or cannot disclose everything. But what I've heard are similar similar recovery rates and similar theft rates. So around or even higher. So around 10% of the bikes get stolen over lifetime. And uh, but 70 to 80% get recovered, uh, mostly thanks to IoT, um, but also thanks to, to, to recovery teams that are uh, in certain areas and are quickly to jump out. And once they the bike gets uh, gets stolen, the user uh, reports it's stolen, the recovery team sees it on the app, ah, it's here and can jump out and recover it quickly. I think this is the key to, to have it successfully uh, working. You know, one thing I'm very passionate about is that, that uh, uh, you know, if you put a lock on it, you're preventing theft. If you have a tracker on it, you can go and get it. Uh, but the best way to prevent theft is to make the after sale value zero. So nobody wants to steal it because there's no value for it. Uh, what we've done on the scooter is, you know, through the IoT, we've built a solution where the motor controller basically always has to get a specific code. And if it doesn't get this code, it will never turn on. Uh, and uh, and nobody can. I mean, of course, professionals could maybe hack it and you know write into it, but uh, but that probably won't happen uh, because most of the theft is relatively amateur. So you can't turn it on. Like you can steal it and you can pull it away, but it will not be usable as a scooter. And and this is something I believe very much into because in in 1980s, immobilizers were were uh, invented for the cars, and I think it was 1989. They were made uh, compulsory in, in Germany. And then in five to seven years, I think it was seven years, car theft in Germany dropped by 92%. So what happened, thanks to immobilizers, was that previously you could just go into a car, put some wires together and drive off. But after that, you couldn't do that anymore. So you could even open the doors, but the car would never turn on. And through that, uh, you just deleted all of the non-professional thieves. So, of course, sometimes cars get stolen, but all of us, we park our cars on the streets and we're not afraid of them being, uh, you know, gone in the morning. So I think this is something where the whole industry has a lot to improve, that the vehicle only turns on when your mobile phone or your watch or something, uh, you know, specific is there. And I think that has a lot of potential. Uh, but do you see, like, a use case for this also, Let's say for if if a customer is uh, in debt or like hasn't paid, uh, can you would you also block their uh, scooter or uh, make it? Yeah. Up? What 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 we will do is that we will uh, uh, limit the speed to three kilometers an hour, and then put up a pop up that hey you haven't paid, so yeah, <laughs> we can do that. So it's really, really inconvenient to use it until you pay. It's really inconvenient to be in debt. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually very uh, something that um, uh, you know. I've talked with a lot of people who have done the same kind of subscription models for for um, uh, consumer electronics, like mobile phones. And 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 one of the guys has done it really big in, in Scandinavia, and he said why Apple beats everybody in the subscription game is because Apple does the subscription themselves, and they can also lock your iPhone if you haven't paid or if it's stolen. And others really can't do it yet, or they haven't built systems to do it. So, and this, when we've communicated with financing, financing activities, you know, banks and etc., then this is something that they're very, they're they're very positively surprised of that you can say, hey, if they don't pay, they can't use it. And this is this is something that really uh, is loved by financing facilities as well. Okay, we're uh, running out of time and I'm really sorry. I see that Kevin uh, <laughs> didn't manage to join the conversation. So let's see if we have any uh, questions here. Feel free to put them down in the question box. Uh, so I see a question here. Uh, Tris, why do you call it subscription rather than monthly rental? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, this, this is a great question. Uh, I think the, the main difference is like uh, the, the servicing element. I think that rentals in general are exclusive of, of uh, servicing. Uh, and subscription are inclusive of servicing. So that's why we call it subscription. Um, I think the, the other, maybe the other thing is that uh, at least in our, in our um, like rentals, it depends on the terms, but like, I guess long-term rentals with services can be, uh, it can be like defined as subscription. Uh, just subscription is a, is an easier word to, uh, to use. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I did. I think it, it. We already talked a bit about the subscription definition when we discussed like uh, uh, those uh, payments for like if you're just selling an e-bike but uh, calling it subscription and like uh, even the terms uh, are a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it long-term rental or just uh, pay pay take now and use later? Um, okay, I have here some more questions. Um, how do you plan on educating traditional consumers that might be programmed to accept more of an ownership culture on the benefits of subscription? Christian, this, I think this is a challenge for you uh, since you're launching next week. Yeah, I mean, what we did, uh, you know, we're keeping the sales as well, and then we're going to have a subscription on top of it. Um, and we, when you were buying the scooter, you had three options. You had like basic, uh, I think it was called Pro, and then performance. You know, three options, like three model options. And we're going to delete the basic, and instead of that, so when you want to buy the vehicle, you will see, you know, Pro version, some price, performance version, some price, and then you would have a. Instead of the basic, we will write down, hey, but if you want to have like the 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 quickest or the cheapest option, then maybe you should take our subscription. So. That's just one way of putting it, just really communicating out to the people that that's a very easy way to start. But of course, there will be still people who want to buy vehicles, as Tris said before as well. But what I'm very interested of, um, and it's very exciting, is that if you have this subscription model, you can basically open up the marketing playbook of whatever SaaS company, Netflix, whoever, and start pushing them and saying, hey, if you refer a friend, you get one month for free. Hey, you know, so sign up now, you get two months for one euro and then it will go for 45. There's so much of these marketing tricks uh, that have been tested on other uh, on other industries. So I think end of the day, it's really, you know, getting this hook on people, which is much harder to do if you're selling the vehicle. Yeah, because as you mentioned, the entry barrier is so much lower and uh, you can just play around with it a lot. So just raise your hand who has a Netflix subscription, you know. And yeah. who, who has had some months where they haven't never used it because they've been traveling or just enjoying life, but you haven't canceled it either. Yeah. Oh, we have here a surprise guest. <laughs> Hello, Kevin. And uh, see, can you hear us? So I... As long as Kevin sets up, I think there's one more question. One is, are you operating in B2C or B2B? Uh, yeah. Driss, a great maybe question you? for Kevin, actually, because, yeah. uh, hello, Kevin, can you hear us? Can you hear us? But Driss, maybe you answer it. Uh, do you guys also tolerate uh, food carriers and other people who do like Commercial yeah. so so we do um, we do exclusively B two C uh, and and um, private users I would say uh, the reason we've done that is that we think that it's a different product it's a different uh, service to offer B two B so you cannot do in my opinion uh, service uh, offering like a B two C and B two B service is extremely uh, complex and challenging uh, so we took the road of, of doing B2C. There are people who do exclusively B2B and they do it really well and, and we don't want to compete with them. I think the main reasons why we, uh, we went for B2C is that I believe that the, the market is much bigger. Um, we've, from day one, wanted to, uh, to build a strong brand with a strong community around the, the product. Uh, so we felt that going the B2C way was uh, probably better for this. And, um, and also, I mean, very early on, if you're thinking of starting a subscription uh, service in e-bikes, you need to make uh, important decisions when it comes to hardware. And the hardware you build for B2C is totally different from the hardware you build for B2B. It's just 
it's, to, it's not the same product. It's not the same usage. Uh, on average, a delivery courier would do like 100, 150 kilometers per day. Uh, our users do between 15 and or 10 and 15 kilometers a day. Uh, so it's not the same expectations, not the same intensity of usage. Um, and but how do you make sure that they're not used for couriers? Do you detect it with IoT or how, how do you do that? So we obviously that's that's a tough part. Uh, I think we've been pretty good in doing that. First, we've been pretty good at communicating upfront in our terms and conditions on our website that you cannot use the bike for commercial reasons. So that's number one. Um, number two is whenever uh, there are still some people who use it for commercial reasons, uh, what we have is that through the IoT, where we know on average, obviously that's anonym, anonymized, but we're able to see like how many kilometers per, per, per day uh, someone would ride a bike. And, uh, and if we see abnormal data, people riding 150, 200 kilometers a day, we investigate a little bit more and, and we're able to find out if it's a career or not. And then you just reach out and say, hey, sorry, um, you can't use it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, Kevin, if you can hear us and uh, speak out, but actually, uh, <laughs> glad that you could join finally. But uh, a really hi. relevant question that yeah. you Yeah, hi, hi Fa. Hey. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. I'm going to just turn off my video because the Wi Fi, amongst other things, is not super great here. Um, I, 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 I missed this, the start of it, but um, you know, for what it's worth, I run subscription in Toronto and Vancouver, uh, electric pedal bikes. We started off uh, four years ago, uh, uh, think, you know, basically with the idea of swap feats in mind, trying to, to focus on consumers. And, and in both cities have been uh, somewhat overwhelmed by the demand from uh, food delivery. And so we decided to create another door for food delivery. It's more expensive. And, you know, but the same uh, back, back end can service both consumers and food delivery. Um, you know, it's an ongoing discussion and an evaluation, um, the costs and the expense, uh, the revenue and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where we are. Uh, and we try and, and, and have bikes and keep the two fleets somewhat separate, but um, any, <laughs> <laughs> but very often food delivery, uh, you know, the demand, let me say, has not been the problem in our business. Uh, Kristen, are you planning to uh, provide scooters for delivery guys or not? No, at the moment not. I mean, because basically the same stuff that Chris says, it's a different product. So if you build a product for direct to consumer, it's it's very hard to 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 make both sides happy. We'll have to build a different product. Uh, yeah, uh, we are unfortunately running a bit out of uh, time here. So maybe a last question to Kevin, since you, you just joined and haven't had any, any word in. So let's see, we have so many questions here. Uh, we're going to try to answer those questions all uh, later, uh, also in written and share them uh, to everybody who's listened in, because there's a lot of uh, really interesting questions here. Uh, so yeah, let's... Obviously yeah, uh, Kevin, if you see any interesting questions there that you want to pick up, let's see. Uh, maybe a question for you. How long is your expected uh, lifetime of your e-bikes? Yeah, especially considering how cold the winters are there in Canada. <laughs> so yeah, it's not not so much the cold, maybe the salt. Um, it's it's a good it's a good question. You know, we just started selling our used e-bikes about eight months ago. I will say that when I first started, um, you know, focused on consumer, we went with Gazelle uh, products. And when I started selling bikes, that small group of Gazelles that I managed to buy before the pandemic, um, I'm basically selling them at uh, the price I paid for them uh, 36, three years ago. And so um, uh, that has been good. It's it's certainly nicer in the bike industry where you purchase a wholesale bike for two thirds the retail price compared to the car sharing industry that I used to be in, which where there was very little gap. Um, but uh, you know we're certainly we're trying to basically for our finance company we need to build the used bike market so they understand that we'll be able to sell these bikes. And so we're, we're very focused on, on selling bikes now as well, uh, on the, especially on the used side, just to, to try and um, show them 
what the real depreciation rate is. So basically, on the uh, consumer side of subscription, uh, you know, the depreciation rate is pretty much zero for at least the first year, uh, based on the price that that we paid for those bikes. If we're using, um, you know, from another OEM, uh, that's the good news. Is it could be, you know. 0% the first year, 1% the second year or less and, and, and similar. Um, you know, how long we're gonna keep them really depends, you know, we're trying to, you know, we're still dealing with the, with the uh, COVID, you know, the, uh, the after effects of COVID in terms of when we would buy just any bikes we could get to trying to, to buy the bikes that define our brand as we, as we move forward. So, um, you know, that's, we have about a thousand bikes just over in um, Toronto and uh, a smaller fleet in Vancouver. And one thing uh, that I noticed uh, when I was going through some backgrounds on all of you is that you're all looking towards the States. Uh, is that true? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a big... We... Yeah, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, it's a big market. I happen to be in Miami today. You know, it's certainly there's a lot of, of interest here, but it's also very different. You know, Miami is enormously uh, car oriented, you know, so um, that, that's, there's just differences there. And, you know, for what it's worth, uh, we compete against Zumo uh, in Toronto, and they uh, withdrew from six cities in the United States uh, six months ago. So just something to keep in mind. Some marketing here. <laughs> we are launching on the 18th of May uh, in US and in Europe at the same time. In US, we will be collaborating with a new company that's gonna be out there uh, doing uh, vehicle subscription, uh, kind of a you know a dealer that tries to do it for different uh, different parties. Uh, Dries, uh, I saw has uh, has history with the founder of that new company, Michael Keating. So Michael setting up a new company, uh, but you'll find out more in, in the 18th. But I think in general, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, subscription or ownership. US is, I don't know, five or 10 years behind Europe. So it will be a wild, wild west for everybody to, to go and explore. And hopefully, if subscription models get there, you know, early enough, maybe they even skip this really strong ownership model and go directly there. Um, so I think there's huge opportunity for sure, but time will tell how it will be adopted. All right, uh, let's wrap things up and uh, I'll make sure that we also get some uh, good insights from Kevin in, uh, in writing so that uh, their story also could be shared and uh, we'll go through all your questions. There's tons of them here still. It really seems that people want to learn more about this topic and really kind of push this further. So that's really great to see. So uh, thank you everybody. Thanks to our speakers and uh, who listened in and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy cycling and scooting. <laughs>